The following program is a color feature presentation on the HSN Television Network. This Week in Pro Football is brought to you by Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. And by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. This week in the first half of our show, we'll see Minnesota's Purple Gang gain revenge for their only loss. And we'll see the Dolphins as they continue their renaissance. And Pat will watch as the Jets topple the ever-sinking Patriots and as the Cowboys bounce back to deluge the Redskins. We'll also see the Bears and Broncos, how they won behind new starting quarterbacks. We'll see all of those games and more right after this message. The Packers travel to face the Vikings in Minnesota, where 40 mile an hour winds brought the wind chill factor to 25 below zero. On the kind of day where every collision hurts, even the ball tried to avoid contact. It was the type of afternoon made for defenses, as both quarterbacks learned that handling the football was a dangerous proposition. The score at halftime was three all, and although the results were the same, the means were different. The Vikings relied on the rushes of Dave Osborne. While the Vikings ran, Bart Starr spurned the weather and threw the ball through the frozen air. In the second half, the team switched game plans. Gary Quazzo teamed with Gene Washington to set up the only touchdown of the game on a run by Clint Jones. Meanwhile, the Packers turned to the run. Donnie Anderson's sweep put the ball on Minnesota's 18-yard line with two minutes left. But when Larry Krause, number 30, fumbled and Jim Marshall recovered for Minnesota, the Vikings had their sixth straight win and a death grip on the NFC Central Division title. 
An AFC Eastern Division game was played in more pleasant weather. The temperature in Miami was 70 degrees higher than in Minnesota as the first place Colts met the second place Dolphins with coach Don Shula seeking revenge. The Colts started as impressively as they had in the team's first meeting, a 35-0 Baltimore win. Jim Duncan took the opening kickoff 57 yards to set up a field goal. The Colt defense continued their onslaught on Bob Greasy, just as it had three weeks before. Then came the play that turned the momentum around. Jake Scott raced 77 yards with a punt to start the ball rolling. Bob Greasy rolled it a little farther when he went 15 yards on a quarterback draw. And Paul Warfield rolled it farther yet on a 27-yard touchdown pass reception to put Miami in front 21-3. But Johnny Unitas wasn't finished, and his passes began hitting their mark. Unitas threw two touchdown passes as the Colts fought back. One was on a four-yard flip to Roy Jefferson, the other was a two-yard pop to Tom Mitchell. Miami's clinching touchdown came on a 51-yard catch and run greasy to Carl Noonan. Despite the loss, the Colts held on to first place. But Shula's Dolphins had beaten his ex-pupils 34-17 in the rematch with a clutch game that kept Miami in the postseason playoff picture.
Pat, I've got a biggie. I learned that some people really learn something from watching this week in pro football. Now, Fran Tarkenton, the New York Giant quarterback, claims that religiously on Saturday night he watches this show up in New York City and gets at least one good offensive play from all the league action we show, and he uses that running the Giant attack the following Sunday. So maybe we're doing some good after all. I hope so. Which brings to mind, you know, that offensive plays and oftentimes game-breaking plays can come from strange places. I'm sure you remember a game between the Giants and the Eagles back in 1961 at Yankee oh, Stadium. Yeah. Uh, Pete Praveed, our clubhouse boy, the giant clubhouse boy, said, you, you got all these fast guys playing defense, why don't you use them on offense? And so we put in a special play just before the half and wound up with uh, Maxie Bond, a linebacker, covering Erich Barnes, who at that time was a defensive back with the Giants and who possesses great speed, a mismatch. They get them from strange places, but they also go over those movies religiously. Uh, the Eagle coaches, after knocking off the Giants in that Monday night ball game, they were back in the Eagles' office at 7.30 the next morning going over those movies. And the movies don't lie, Pat. I'm afraid it might have run me off a long time ago. You used to get out of the picture. <laughs> it's right. really become a science, though. They really devote an awful lot of time to studying weaknesses in defense and strong points that they feel that they can take advantage of. It's a lot of fun. What's next, Pat? Well, Tom, last week the Cowboys showed some signs of returning to life as they blasted the Redskins with the help of a rookie running back. And the Jets had some help from a young runner also as they took the Patriots apart. In Shea Stadium, the Boston Patriots suffered their ninth straight loss. However, their defense had one moment of glory when number 23 Daryl Johnson broke the Shea Stadium hop, skip, and jump record. By blitzing all their linebackers and even a safety or two, Boston did manage to nullify the passing attack that had destroyed the Los Angeles Rams. Against the run, Boston was just as stingy, but for the ninth straight week, the Patriots offense failed to complement their belligerent defense as the Jets held Boston to a paltry 80 yards in total offense. Joe Capp's jump shots fluttered harmlessly away from his receivers, and he completed just five passes all afternoon. Missed assignments by his line resulted in a physical beating for Capp, while missed mental assignments plagued his substitute, Mike Tolliver, number 17. The Jets' offense, though not overpowering, was lucky enough to win. Setback George Knock eased through the Patriots' gutty defense for two touchdowns as the New York Jets won their second straight game 17-3. There were two contests up for grabs in Washington, a shootout and a chewout between the Redskins and Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys won both duels as they chewed up Washington 45-21. People ask, how can the Redskins lose? They boast the leading rusher in pro football, Larry Brown, number 43. And the NFL's top receiver, Charlie Taylor, number 42, who can turn up a 10-yard square out into a touchdown. To add to this impressive arsenal, they have quarterback Sonny Jurgensen's buggy whip arm, a weapon that connected for three touchdowns against Dallas. One went to tight end Jerry Smith. The second to lonesome Larry Brown. And the third, a deflection from Mel Renfro to John Henderson. Why does Washington lose? Not because they suffer the improbable happening of a Chuck Howley fumble return, but because their defense cannot cope with an offense that can score suddenly and often. On Sunday, they could not cope with rookie Dwayne Thomas, who was knocked out on the opening kickoff 
but returned to score three times and rush for over 100 yards. Thomas has the power to blast free from traffic and the speed to burn by defenders with a tackling angle. Probably the most encouraging sign to troubled Tom Landry was the way his quarterback, Craig Morton, turned Washington pressure into big gains. Morton found his receivers with deft lobs or scorchers like this connection with Lance Rensel. The Cowboys even turned misfortune into a score when Mark Washington fumbled and dribbled a redskin kickoff and then spurted 99 yards to a touchdown. The Cowboys had not only avenged their previous week's humiliation by the St. Louis Cardinals, but remained in serious contention for the title in the NFL East. We'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. No one falls from fame to obscurity faster than a pro quarterback who repeatedly fails in a starting role. The last Sunday, two quarterbacks gained at least temporary reprieve from pro football limbo as they regained starting jobs with impressive victories. At Wrigley Field, Chicago, the chill factor hovered around zero as the Bears once again rolled out their version of the welcome wagon, this time for the Buffalo Bills. Dick Butkus, number 51, Leroy Caffey, number 60, and Doug Buffon, number 55, were busy all afternoon, introducing the Bills to Chicago-style football. The Bear defense, although probably the most physical anywhere, has not been forcing the errors that turn ball games around. Not until Sunday, that is, as the Bears were all over the field, making breaks for themselves, even to the point of ad-libbing a few. While Chicago's defense has remained intact for the season, the offense has seen considerable shuffling. The latest deal had Bobby Douglas, number 10, back at quarterback. Anxious to succeed in his first start of 1970, he threw a touchdown pass on the Bears' first play of the game. Unfortunately, it went to the Bills' Butch Bird, number 42. <laughs> Having seen Butkus in action, the Bills showed a remarkable ability to knock a few heads themselves. They got to Douglas a total of seven times and managed to upset his timing on passes he did get off.
But Douglas did settle down and threw four touchdown passes. Two of them went to Dick Gordon, number 45, who continues to be the Bears' most productive receiver. But the Bears unveiled yet another wrinkle in their offense. The former Notre Dame star, Jim Seymour, number 84. He collected a second quarter pass and slid safely into home for the Bears' second touchdown. Seymour, who is recovering from a year-long case of the Army, was then part of one of the season's great plays. Douglas was scrambling around from the rush when he suddenly fired a pass 60 yards in the air to Seymour, all alone in the end zone. Douglas completed only eight passes in 20 attempts, but they were enough as the Bears won 31-13. The new combination of Douglas to Seymour will have to wait, though, until next year because Douglas broke his wrist. But they may be just what the Bears need to complement Dick Butkus, who is, of course, a combination all by himself. If you're feeling sick, New Orleans is not a bad place to get healthy. And that's where the Denver Broncos took their ailing offense. Though suffering through a four-game losing streak, Denver again got a premier performance from the number two ranked defense in the AFC. Rich Jackson, number 87, Dave Costa, number 63, and Paul Smith, number 70, led a fired-up defense that smothered the Saints' attack and held New Orleans to a pair of first-quarter field goals. Through the losing streak, it had been Denver's erratic quarterbacking that had betrayed them. But Pete Lisk, number 14, returned to the starting lineup and gave Denver the kind of quarterbacking they'll need from now on if they're to remain contenders. In the second quarter, his 74-yard completion to Billy Van Houston, number 42, was the big play of the game, and the Broncos never looked back. Three plays later, Lisk found Al Denson, number 88, for that touchdown that put Denver ahead to stay. With a minute and 35 seconds left in the half, Lisk drove Denver 52 yards in seven plays and threw another touchdown pass to Jim Whalen, number 83. The entire drive consumed less than one minute. Of course, Lisk got quite a bit of help from Floyd Little, number 44, the AFC's leading rusher. Little gained over 100 yards rushing and receiving and scored one touchdown. He then sat out the fourth quarter while rookie Bobby Anderson, number 11 from Boulder, Colorado, scored another as Denver even its record at 5-5 five and five by trouncing New Orleans 31-6.
We'll be right back to this week in pro football following station identification. This is the HSN Television Network. In the second half of our show, we'll see another chapter in the life of the old man from Oakland, as well as the clash in Missouri between the two big red machines. We'll also see the Browns and the Bengals as they win to keep the race in the AFC Central right up in the air. And we'll see the 49ers lose to the Lions, while the Rams are defeating the Falcons, a combination of events that sets the stage for this week's Ram 49ers showdown. Well, that's going to be a good one. Ought to be. And on the feature, we'll see some football players whose off-the-field pursuit involves appearing in Hollywood films as opposed to coaching films. We'll see that feature, and we'll have more exciting action on This Week in Pro Football right after this brief message. As performers on a 100-yard stage, pro football players must sometimes express themselves in ways other than a trap block or a blitz. For some, even these expressions are not enough, and they are pursuing careers as movie actors. And they bring with them their unique experience as professional athletes. As a wide receiver for nine years, Bernie Casey finessed artfully through enemy secondaries. But now Bernie has given up the golden game for the silver screen. And he is another kind of artist facing another kind of challenge. Slater, you are an amateur. You don't know what being lonely really is. But if it's conversation you're looking for, you tell me how you got to be a cripple. And I'll tell you all about being black. While Bernie was taking his lumps, other players were taking their cue. Merlin Olson, number 74, has a circle of friends who deal often in violence. But as the gentle Leviathan and the undefeated, he prefers the younger set. Tell me it ain't what 
I think it is. I can't fight. I'm tired of hurting people. This time you gotta fight. You got to uphold the honor of the outfit. I can't. If pro football players found it easy to portray action roles, they found it even easier to portray themselves as Alex Karras and the Detroit Lions did in Paper Lion. take first things first and in that order we should hear a word from our beloved coach Joe Schmidt Joe <laughs> There's no saying how far this will go, but as auditions continue from week to week, it's becoming obvious that pro football greets the movies with open arms. The two leaders in the AFC West each struggle with bitter rivals from their own state. The championship of Missouri resulted in a standoff. The last week in California, an old gray beard from Oakland again pulled out a game for the Raiders. San Diego charged into Oakland, intent on destroying the title dreams of the high-flying Raiders, leaders in the AFC West. Number 27, Gary Garrison, a smooth and exciting wide receiver, has been one of the few consistent performers. The two leaders in the AFC West each struggle with bitter rivals from their own state. The championship of Missouri resulted in a standoff. The last week in California, an old gray beard from Oakland again pulled out a game for the Raiders. San Diego charged into Oakland, intent on destroying the title dreams of the high-flying Raiders, leaders in the AFC West. Number 27, Gary Garrison. A smooth and exciting wide receiver has been one of the few consistent performers in a San Diego offense that has been off and on this year. Garrison's two touchdown receptions gave San Diego a 14-7 lead, and it appeared the Chargers' upset dream would become a reality. But the Oakland Raiders are a team known for their second-half explosiveness, and they played true to form as the trend changed in favor of Oakland. A great catch by Boletnikov that ended in a dual possession call against San Diego was just one of the frustrations the Chargers endured in the second half. The call set off one of the best performances seen in California since topless dancers arrived.
Young Charlie Smith, number 23, a third year running back from Utah, banged over for two scores, but when a San Diego field goal tied the score at 17, the stage was set for a typical Oakland finish. Number three, Darrell LaMonica, is one of the best quarterbacks in the game, but his talents have been overshadowed in recent weeks by a 43-year-old man who has become Oakland's star. LaMonica's run gave Oakland good field position with only seven seconds left in the game. And seven seconds was enough time for 21-year veteran George Blanda to climb out of his rocking chair and casually amble onto the field to win another game. Blanda's 16-yard field goal not only won the game for Oakland, 20 to 17, but it was the fifth time this season that the old man has rescued the Raiders from defeat. George Blanda says he will continue playing as long as he can walk to the bank. And for Oakland opponents, that could be a painfully long time. In Kansas City, it was cold. The game between the St. Louis Cardinals and the Kansas City Chiefs was billed as the championship of Missouri. The symbol of pro football supremacy in that state, the Governor's Cup, was at stake. But just about everyone would have settled for a cup of hot coffee. Fans, players, and sportscasters were all searching for ways to stay warm. Kansas City's Lynn Dawson tried a glove, but unfortunately, he wore it on the wrong hand. It was so cold that players were concerned with catching frostbite as they were with catching the football. The combination of bitter cold weather and rib cracking hitting made pass receiving a dangerous occupation. The Chiefs got the first big break when linebacker Jim Lynch, number 51, hijacked a Jim Hart pass and rumbled past midfield. The interception set up one of two field goals by Jan Stinnerud, the AFC's leading scorer. Stinnerud's field goal snapped a three-game St. Louis shutout streak and gave the Chiefs a 6-0 halftime lead. On a day when it was almost too cold to move, there was lots of action between the goal lines, but very few points. The Cardinal passing game was often effective, but when points were needed, the birds froze up. While St. Louis's passing attack was often sporadic, the Kansas City air game barely existed. The Chiefs completed only five passes all day, and their only consistent weapon was running back Ed Podolak, number 14. A fourth quarter Kansas City field goal attempt almost resulted in disaster for the Chiefs as number 22 Roger Worley nearly went all the way for what could have been the winning touchdown. The Cardinals salvaged the tie when Jim Bakken's field goal nodded the score at six. The pro football champion of Missouri is still unknown, but both teams have a bigger game in mind. It's called the Super Bowl.
Tom, you know, we're getting into the time of the season now where the players are starting to think a little bit about uh, trips to the Pro Bowl and being picked on all-star teams. And I think a lot of people have the idea that this doesn't really mean too much, that it's just a formality. But mm. reputation and trips to the Pro Bowl and being picked on all pro teams and any all-star team means an awful lot. Well, that's true, Pat. People like, uh, you know, you and I, we sit upstairs and maybe we embellish a reputation, but the guy really earns it playing down that football field. And I always felt like that the, the players' all-pro team was the one to, to get on, that if you go to the offensive tackles, you'll find out who the best defensive end is. Uh, He'll, he's the guy that'll tell you that it's Deacon Jones that's the toughest to handle and he needs help. So I think you go to the source, go right on the field and ask the player and you'll find out who the best are. That seems to be the logical way to do it. For example, I'd come to a defensive back like you to find out uh, who is the toughest receiver to cover. An offensive guard uh, enraptured in his own little element in the middle has no idea about who is a really effective wide receiver except by reputation and by what you said a minute ago, by reading the write-ups about the games and by hearing what's said over television and radio. And make no mistake, the player likes to be all pro and he loves to go in the offseason and know that he is one of the best, you know? Then again, I think it's true that the most legitimate way and the most authentic way to pick an all pro team would, would be the vote and uh, the opinions of the players themselves. Players themselves, you? I think so too. I'll vote for you. Okay, you got my vote. <laughs> what's next time? Well, Pat, last week Cleveland and Cincinnati both won. I don't know if anyone's been keeping an eye on the Bengals, but they've been sneaking up on the Browns, who are presently leading in the AFC Central. Let's take a look at those teams right now. In Cleveland, the Browns were determined to break a three-game losing streak, their longest ever. To do it, they would have to defeat a team they had never played before, the Houston Oilers, led by a quarterback they had played many times but never beaten, number 12, Charlie Johnson. Last week's Johnson's key to victory was number 34, an unpublicized rookie running back from Wisconsin named Joe Dawkins. Dawkins carried 22 times for a surprising 143 yards and two touchdowns. But Cleveland's newest nemesis proved only human after all, and it cost the Oilers another touchdown. Jim Houston's recovery temporarily saved the Browns. At times, it seemed the Oilers were trying too hard for an upset. Alvin Reed, number 89, proved that it's not always a good idea to try too hard for that one extra yard. Medical marvel Charlie Johnson again proved that it's possible to play pro football with a broken collarbone clamped in a steel vise. But for the first time in eight years, Johnson could not beat his old cousins, the Browns. For the first time in a month of Sundays, the Browns had enough big plays to win. Leroy Kelly swept to one score and became one of the select few ever to rush for over 5,000 yards in a career. Bill Nelson passed to his other running back, Bo Scott, for another Cleveland score. Number 16, Bill Nelson, appreciated all the help he could get, and he got some help which bordered on magic from a 240-pound second-year tight end from Florida State named Charles Chip Glass, number 83. Glass not only showed he can score in a crowd, but he also showed how to beat the blitz and turn a short pass into a long touchdown.
But for the heroics of Charles Chip Glass, the Oilers might be only one half game behind Cleveland, who would be tied for first with Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. But Chip Glass and the Browns prevailed, and Cleveland was again at 500 and in sole possession of first place in the AFC's mixed-up Central Division, one game ahead of Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. In India, there's a legend that if a man stares into the eyes of the Bengal tiger, he becomes hypnotized and cannot function properly. In Cincinnati, the Steelers found that the legend is true. Their mistakes cost them heavily and were compounded by the fact that they were called to everyone's attention by the Bengals' new scoreboard. One Pittsburgh error led to this touchdown by number 11, Virgil Carter. And the next time the Bengals got the ball, Carter led them on a beautifully executed drive down the field. Number 18, Paul Robinson, tore up the middle of the Steelers' line. Carter then hit number 25, Chip Myers, who's no relation to Chip Glass. And then it was Paul Robinson again, only this time he swept in for a score. Robinson's touchdown added to the Bengals' lead and touched off some of the exuberance that has made Cincinnati a contender in the last couple of weeks. The Bengal defense has also been a factor in their recent upswing, and as always, the scoreboard chronicled their success in less than a subtle manner. Undaunted, Steeler quarterback Terry Hanratty stared right into the eyes of the Bengal attack and also threw the ball there to number 66, Bill Berge. The interception by Berge was duly noted by the scoreboard. And then Carter hit number 84, Bob Trumpy, whose long strides carried him off to the end zone land. The Cincinnati lead was now insurmountable, but Carter decided to rub it in, and the Bengals' final score came on a beautiful hookup with number 10, Eric Crabtree. And as one Pittsburgh player left the field, he was heard to mutter, why do they keep the poor Tiger mascot of theirs locked in a cage, when what they really need is a muzzle for the scoreboard? Bengals 34, Steelers 7.
In the NFC West, San Francisco's lead dwindled to one game over Los Angeles as the 49ers were devoured by a pride of hungry lions in Detroit. And the Rams rebounded from two straight non-winning games to set up this week's showdown in San Francisco. In Atlanta, the Falcons wanted their first win in nine tries against Los Angeles. The Rams led the conference in defense against the run, but the Falcons appropriately were more at home in the air. Quarterback Bob Berry faked the run and took his pick of two deep receivers, both wide open behind the Ram defense. Paul Gibson's 51-yard touchdown was the only score for Atlanta. Roman Gabriel and the Ram offense fared even worse against Atlanta's tough young defense. Place kicker David Ray provided the only points scored all afternoon by the Los Angeles offense. The Rams defense more than made up for their offensive team's inability to score. They consistently throttle Atlanta's scoring threats and six times the league's leading devourers of quarterbacks reached Bob Berry or his relief Randy Johnson. Midway in the third quarter, the Ram defense won the game. First, a Myron Patios tackle jarred the ball loose. And number 79, 270-pound Coy Bacon scored the first Ram touchdown of the day. Just 46 seconds later, Kermit Alexander, number 39, intercepted and scored the last Ram touchdown of the day. The 17-7 Ram victory wasn't artistically delightful, but it brought the Rams and their never-say-die coach, George Allen, within one game of first place San Francisco in the NFC West. And by now, you probably know where George Allen and the Rams play their next game. As the 49ers visited Detroit, San Francisco coach Dick Nolan knew he could smile because his team was on a hot streak. But Lion coach Joe Schmidt knew that it also helps to have the right people rooting for you. The 49ers themselves certainly weren't out to win new fans. And although number 78 ran a nice circle pattern, the whistle had already blown. Anyway, the 49ers didn't need fans or friends because they had the luck of a winner. On this play, number 18, Gene Washington, outfought the Lions secondary, and his catch caused some dismay among the Detroit players who were learning firsthand that nothing goes wrong for a winner. John Brody's luck continued to run hot as the Lions' Mike Wieger just missed intercepting one of his passes in the end zone. And when it's that close, it's tough to get up and go on. Especially when a quarterback like the 49ers Brody can bounce them off the walls and still make them good. But Brody's luck had finally run its course as Lem Barney, number 20, cut off this scoring threat. Even number 12 must have known he'd reached the end of his string as another potential score was stopped and Mike Wieger got his revenge. Then the Lions offense led by number 11, Greg Landry, took over. 
Landry hit number 88, Charlie Sanders, who also got hit, but who came back to score on a 19-yard pass. Then it was Landry to number 49, Larry Walton, and the Lions were pulling away. Finally, it was Landry to number 25, Earl McCullough, to give the Lions a 28-7 win. And if you were a 49er fan, perhaps it was more than you could face, that all you wanted was a place to hide, somewhere that you could be alone to worry about the Rams. Well, Pat, I guess the outcome of those two games really sets the stage for this week. I've heard a lot of people say the Rams are too old, but you still have to beat that real good defense, don't you? I think everybody's got a lot of respect for that defense. You have to. They got so much experience and play so well. But this is sort of a homecoming from San, for San Francisco. They've been on the road for three weeks now. Now they're back at Kezar, so they're playing good defense, too. And I John like Brody, 49ers. huh? I like the 49ers. I'll go with the Rams because of the big guys up front. I'll remember. We'll see what happens next week. I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall, and we'll see you next week. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. By Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. Promotional consideration is provided by American Motors, makers of the bold new 1971 Javelin with styling so hairy, we even risk turning some people off. Javelin by American Motors. Sports fans don't miss the sporting guide. It's on sale now at newsstands everywhere. This has been a color feature presentation in cooperation with NFL Films through the facilities of Hughes Sports Network.